So that's HIB. H, Haemophilus I, influenza B is the type. Now, the word influenza, as I understand it, is meaning influence. And so it used to be used when people got a certain type of illness, which is characteristic of influenza. Um, this is a bacteria and not a virus. There are some vaccines that are given to babies that are meant to prevent diseases that are absolute pathogens, like Bordetella pertussis, the whooping cough. Uh, or like measles. like So those are things that don't live on us and in us every day. Uh, they come, they infect us, they go away, and then we have immunity. But when it comes to other bacteria, there are many bacteria that actually live in the nasopharynx, which includes the nose. And if you were to look at me sideways, it goes back this way. And then there's you know, sinuses, there's ethmoid sinus in the ear, there's mouth, and then the swallowing tubes, and then the trachea, which isn't sterile. So this whole area, is absolutely loaded with bacteria. And in the course of a lifetime, especially in infancy, we become colonized with potential pathogens, meaning uh, Staphylococcus aureus lives on most of us. We never know we have it. It doesn't cause any problems. Streptococcus, so pneumococcus, you might've heard of the PCV vaccine. That's strep pneumonia, that's pneumococcus. Another one that lives on most children at some point in their lifetimes. Neisseria meningitidis, which is the meningococcal vaccine is targeted towards. Another one that everybody eventually is going to be colonized with. Then you have your Haemophilus influenzae you, that are colonizing in there and, they, and they're working it out with each other and then there's a layer behind those bugs, which is mucus, uh, which contains all kinds of antibodies and immune globulin and white blood cells. And then there's a layer behind that, which is lots of tonsil and lots of, um, uh, lots of um, immune cells backing that up underneath that mucosa. So the mucosa is a slippery part inside your nose, your mouth. The whole area where where the outside world is coming into the body through the nose, through the mouth, by swallowing and breathing, is packed with mucosa, antibody, microbes, and behind that, lymphatic cells to beat the band. Okay, so this is your first line of defense. So in a normal baby, you're gonna have these potential pathogens, mostly just be colonizers, keeping each other in balance, and then your own immune system behind it. So why do they want to have vaccines for these particular things? We now have pneumococcal vaccine, which is actually 13 of the normal commensals. We have the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, which is against one type of Haemophilus influenza. There are many other types. And we have meningococcal vaccines, which are sometimes against A, sometimes against B, sometimes against C, W, different uh, serotypes. And so we're developing problems with these, just like just like all vaccines, once you change the ecosystem, other problems develop that weren't obvious in the beginning. Same thing happened with antibiotics, the same thing happened with viral vaccines. The act of vaccination, the act of giving antibiotics is an uncontrolled experiment on the human microbe with, with long-term effects that we have not yet measured um, and effects an immune system that we barely understand. So back in the day before um, the Hib vaccine, the most severe rates we had were in Native American populations for various reasons, not just the fact that they're natively genetic, uh, but because of their living situations. We saw somewhere probably between 75 and 200 cases per 100,000 uh, population. And then after we started vaccinating, that went down significantly, something like 10, 10 per 100, 10 to 20 per 100,000 for that particular type. Um, and so, they thought, well, that's great, you know, so we've gotten, we've been given Hib, now we're gonna go against pneumococcus, we're gonna go against meningococcus, we're gonna kill all these microbes, we're gonna make people immune so that they don't colonize it, pass it on to other people, and everyone's gonna live happily ever after, except for that's not exactly what happens, and we still don't know what happens because some of these vaccines really haven't been around for, you know, longer than 20 or 30 years. But we do know that the landscape changes. Uh, say there's a viral infection. So viral infections actually do make babies more susceptible to bacterial infections. I mean, any kind of inflammation is going to loosen membranes and allow um, and use up vitamin C and allow these pathogens to go inside. So everything's usually okay if, they're, if these bacteria are just living on the surface or if maybe they breach the surface a little bit and then they're kicked back out. But on occasion, what can happen is that these bacteria can work their way back into the eustachian tubes, which are the tubes that connect uh, basically the throat and the ears. And then there's uh, 
you can have a middle ear infection from it. And so otitis media, that's a middle ear infection that comes in, in the mouth and out through the ear that way. So the Haemophilus influenza B. Isn't that what Gromitz is anyway? What, what is? Gromitz, we call it Gromitz. Grom so after you, after you suck the fluid out, you put the grommet, which basically leaves a hole. And yeah, most of our children have had Gromitz. In, exactly. Um, so most vaccinated are children are going to eventually end up with ear infections. None so, of the unvaccinated peeps that we interviewed. But the middle ear infections, that's one thing. But worse things were happening. Meningitis was happening. And so the biggest concern was meningitis because when you get infected, that's basically a brain infection. And um, the fatality and the aftermath and the rest of the body, that is absolutely horrific, absolutely something you don't want to happen. And then the other thing are bloodborne infections, which can go into joints um, or in other parts of the body. Um, so basically that, and lung, so you can get pneumonia from Haemophilus influenza as well. And elderly people also can get pneumonia. So they vaccinated, they were very successful um, with this Haemophilus influenza B. They made the, you know, the rates of, of carriage go down significantly, the rates of infections have gone. It's probably one of the most successful vaccines, sorry to say, that's ever been created. But that's not the end of the story. They had a beautiful success rate. They went hunting for Haemophilus influenza B. The rates dropped significantly. But what happened in its place, it, the story is only beginning. Uh, yet when you read through stacks of medical articles like I've done all week, you see that it's portrayed as though the story's over and there's this big success. But what we're seeing is Haemophilus influenza A having horrible uh, invasive disease in children, Haemophilus influenza F having horrible invasive disease with very high mortality rate ratios in the elderly, much higher mortality rate ratios than happen in children. And then the non-typable, which have become a problem that were not a problem pre-vaccine. So these non-typable, these are basically Haemophilus influenza without the cap on it um, that carries that particular polysaccharide. So we can't tell you what type it is. We can't make a vaccine against it because the vaccine is against the outer surface. This vaccine has been very successful, but there's always a bigger story. So when you knock down Haemophilus influenza B, other Haemophilus comes about. Prior to the vaccine, there were 20,000 cases of invasive infections annually, 12,000 of which were meningitis. The mortality rate was 5%. Now, mind you, when the older people are getting Haemophilus influenza F, their mortality rate's like 20 to 25%. It's really bad. Um, so basically what we've done is we've traded decreasing Haemophilus influenza in B, B in babies for increasing other types in babies and toddlers and markedly increasing Haemophilus influenza F at a higher mortality rate in the elderly.